Hey fans, welcome back to the Fanvesta Report, a weekly podcast covering the business of celebrity that fans want in on. I'm your host, Jose Moyer, a fellow fan and investor. Let's catch up on the latest in fandom and finance. A trillion dollar infrastructure bill has fans of tech looking up. Shriver crowdfunded her way to gold, and you don't have to be in Vegas to bet like you are. Robin Hood continues to be a disruptive force, and fans can now invest in Fanvester. Keep it here to find out more on this week's episode of the Fanvester Report, featuring a one-on-one -on -one interview with the founder and CEO of Fanvester, Michael Colomb. BMX rider Bethany Shriver won gold after crowdfunding her bid to the Tokyo Olympics. The 22-year-old British BMX racer is the current Olympic champion, and she made history at the 2020 Olympics, becoming the first UK BMX rider to win the gold with strong fan engagement. The decision was made by UK Sport, the government agency, to financially support only male BMX riders for Tokyo. With her rivals all around the world being funded, she wasn't going to let her dream of competing in Tokyo be taken away only because of money. The BBC reported Shriver raising around $69,500 from fans. Caesars Entertainment has launched a new sports betting app leveraging a national celebrity campaign. They're calling on Star Power to introduce the app to fans so they no longer need to be on the strip to bet like they're in Vegas. The app, Caesars Sportsbook, integrates sports betting tools with the company's rewards program and will spotlight Curb Your Enthusiasm actor J.B. Smoove and fellow celeb Peyton Oswalt. Since the 1970s, Caesars Palace has reigned as a gambling hotspot and today is still a trusted name in casino entertainment. Sports betting has always been popular at Caesars, who's been voted the best Las Vegas sports betting destination four years in a row by Review Journal. With a rebrand and an upgrade, Caesars Online Sportsbook will provide customized offers, flexible limits, and a wide range of betting lines, and an intuitive user experience. According to the CEO, Caesars Sportsbook also brings players into an empire of play, where win or lose, every wager gives them more through the awards program. With the largest customer loyalty program in the industry, it's also backed by a multi-million dollar comprehensive marketing campaign. So win or lose, fans are always earning points. Robin Hood is back in the spotlight after their initial public offering two weeks ago. Shares of the Hood opened at $38, and in typical meme stock magic, they skyrocketed 85% on Wednesday. It's been a wild week for the Hood, who announced its plan to acquire Say Technologies, a communications platform used by companies during earning calls and proxy votes. Michael Gallone, the founder and CEO of Fanvestor, is an innovator in the world of business and fintech. He is a senior executive, entrepreneur, company builder, and strategic visionary who's enjoyed a career record of success in launching startup companies and leading them through explosive growth and profitable exit or IPO, as well as senior leadership roles with midsize and large public corporations. He has been a key transformational leader in two IPOs, multiple M&A transactions, and rapid business growth. Michael knows how to value businesses, inspire teams, and take organizations to new heights. We are all fans of something or someone, investing our time and loyalty, but getting little in return. Well, it's about to change forever with Fanvestor, a platform that lets you get in on celebrity businesses early on, buy shares of their new startups, support a charity and new product drops, and share once-in-a-lifetime experiences with them. What's up, it's Amari Stoudemire here, and we're launching Masa with Fanvestor to offer a limited edition, perks, products, and experience to my fans. Here's how it works. Go to fanvestor.com. Choose an opportunity you want to get in on. Click here and there, and you're done. Go check your email for the investor's certificate. And don't forget to check back often for updates on your new business investment. It's official now. Celebrate your support with an experience. Go 10 rounds in the gym with Amare. Get a matching tattoo with Super Dope Q. Or get on FaceTime and hang out by the pool with DJ Khaled. After all, you're more than a fan now. You're a fan fester. So Michael, I would love for you to share a bit more about your personal experience and background taking these companies public, your successful exits, because I know so many other fans and entrepreneurs like myself can only dream about these opportunities. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Jocelyn. So frankly, uh, like I said, um, an IPO is just an, uh, the financing event for some, and but some folks don't realize it and they think this is the exit strategy. And the problem is that once the company becomes public, you are um, under microscope of, uh, from not just your employees, 
your your investors, but also from your competitors and also from the regulators. And the shareholders. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your, your shareholders, investors. That's exactly the incoming investors. So the <coughs> and then the life of the company changes because sometimes in your business you have different life cycles. You can be, you know, you can maybe you make more money during the Q4, like, or maybe your year end should be March or whatever. The problem is with the public companies, they think in a quarterly ways. And you always have to perform better quarter after quarter. And sometimes some investors don't understand that. And, they ca and it doesn't benefit the company because then the managers who are managing that company, they change the way they think about the company. And it's, it's probably not what <coughs> originally was done by the founders. So taking a step back, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, the first company I've taken public that was back in 2000, 2001. That was security access management company. Uh, we had really good investors, AOL, Reuters, ICG, Seligman, DFJ. Uh, we raised quite some money. We were competing with RSA Technologies, Net Netegrity. We filed uh, to go public with Merrill Lynch. We filed during dot-com days. And that's where the market went like this and went there. By the time employees were able to sell anything, the mar we were under the water. Because typically mm -hmm. when, you go when the company goes public, the first six months, or sometimes could be 12 months, you're locked out. You cannot sell. So I say that uh, that was a beautiful exit with, uh, with, an, with, an, with uh, we learned. You know, investors got their money back, employees got their experience. <laughs> <laughs> so then the Priceless. Absolutely. It's like in a credit card commercial, right? Um, uh, but, uh, but let's look at another, another IPO. Back in 2005, 2006, I 2005, I moved to Europe. I was recruited out to take a company public on the London Stock Exchange. <coughs> the company was valued uh, by bankers at, uh, when, when I arrived, about $167 million. In 18 months from that point, we took it public for $2.1 billion. Uh, wow. Deutsche, Deutsche Bank and UBS and Amura took us public. Uh, it, was a, it was a great experience. It was a very well-run exercise. The, there was a very good culture created in the company. Um, I was allowed to hire the folks high who can do the job, and it's definitely a team effort. And it's a work ethics. It's 100 hour weeks. Uh, it's very sharp professionals who are not, no micromanagement. Everyone creates a job and gets that done. And this is very rewarding when you ring the bell at the end. Like you, you're, you're dying. I mean, I remember the, the, we had a road show. In nine days, we visited, we had 142 meetings, we visited 11 countries. 142 meetings in nine days, days. And, and visiting so we would fly in to let's say to, uh, to, to London from London go to Boston Boston to New York then we had a f uh, call with Japan uh, video call because we were just exhausted and you're sitting in a car you're like this you just you just you don't even know what time it is of a day it is and then the, what what ho worked for us and that's what they train us is a <coughs> you don't drink two uh, look I'm talking about alcohol yeah, right of course. two you work out you, as soon as you get to the, to, the, to the hotel, even if you're exhausted as hell, you go to the gym and you work out. Uh, wor when you're working out, uh, with your first sweat, you get uh, you lose your uh, jet lag. And that's it's just a lot of things. And, and it's also this exercise helps us to build a team. And it's how we gel together. By, th by the second part of this road show, we already knew each other's answers from day left and right. And that was just an amazing experience. But again, one and, and we had a professional trainer who was hired to teach us how to do, how to answer questions. That always CEO would answer every question that would defer. So nobody jumps over each other. And it really showed a very beautiful hour between the team members. Uh, the company that vote was a very successful IPO. It was $2.1 billion. We raised $430 million. Then we had, um, uh, we uh, brought in UBS that helped us to do rating, to do Eurobonds. We had raised over half a billion dollars in Eurobonds. I've got to ask you, what did you do to celebrate I mean, this seems <laughs> unreal. I won't tell you. I won't tell you here. Oh, okay, <laughs> off the camera. No, but no, but but it, it was just emotional celebration. It's um, look, I used to be a professional chess player. To me, it's like it becomes like a sport to be number number mm -hmm. two is the biggest loser. So when you're doing this professional sports, you just want to be always one because if you actually look at look at football ch uh, soccer championship just had just finished in Europe, the silver medalist. They were throwing mod medals on the ground. They didn't want to take silver medals. The same thing here, once you're professional um, in this neighborhood, you just want to succeed. And it's the excitement was that the my, uh, I was so excited, but there's some team members on, on my team that were just, that was the first time for them 
because for me it was already second or third, so I already felt this, this, this. I had a taste of that. But those guys, th they're seeing the smile on their faces and the excitement, like this mature excitement, like it's, it's not fake. And the main shareholder, he was super excited because his son was a CEO. He was younger than me, and for him it was really a training. So the main shareholder, who is a billionaire, he was really excited. I saw he, he came and said, thank, thank you, he shook my hand with two hands. And to him, that meant that it was really meant. Because in, in, in Europe, people, everyone shakes. But when two hands, it's matter like a, a very natural, uh, uh, personal level. So that, that, that meant a big deal on, 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 on me. And you didn't stop there. No. <laughs> uh, the, the resume list goes on and on, the credits, the accolades, and now Fanvestor. Tell me about what Fanvestor is from <coughs> your perspective and where did you get this genius it's idea? No, it's, not it's not genius. It I, I think, I think, <laughs> thank, you, thank you. You're too kind. So, um, in my career, like I said, I, I work in, uh, uh, around uh, the world. I would uh, thank God, uh, work with the really good people teams and learned a lot from really good t coaches and teachers um, and it's all was around accredited investors uh, only for selected few mm -hmm. because like let's say you, when you do f uh, an IPO in the United States or even in Europe with the Europe American investors it's under 144A examinations under it's a it's a security exchange commission of 1934 1933 act where you only allowed to, to sell to specific folks with accreditation and plus bankers are the ones who choose even at that time who they're going to show your case to. And can you explain to the fans what accreditation means? Sure, abs absolutely, absolutely. Well, maybe why don't I take a step back and explain what's the standard process in investment banking? Yes. Maybe that could go also provide more. So it's investment banking, you typically have three stages. First stage is when an investment banker comes to a client, and it's very minimal process by the way, um, and says, hey, you will let, let me solve your problem. Do you, are you trying to go need more money? Maybe an IPO, maybe a secondary offering, maybe you get debt finance and convertible, whatever. Once they agree to that, and typically the relationship there is that banker been been dining and whining, uh, uh, whining, uh, uh, you know, those, the company for 20 years, having a very personal relationship, sending fra fla flowers to hu a husband or wife, uh, you know, entertaining. So it's really personal. It's very, very. Mm -hmm. It's it's an 18th century banking. It's yes. for the last two, three hundred years. That's how it's been. Very manual process, <coughs> which is fine. Which is that's the way it should could it's be. It's tradition. It's very traditional. So we should respect that. Once is that they determine that this is what has to happen. The next phase, and uh, it's basically during this completion of the phase, they hire, let's say, accountants or lawyers to really package that candy. They do the package and everything else. One is packaged. That means that the product is ready to go, let's say an IPO, like S1 offering in the United States. It's phase two, that's the banker call, it's called underwriting, price discovery. It's when the banker says, okay, now that I got that beautiful candy, what is the candy worth in the market today? Uh, for example, what are my comps? What, are, what market can, can penetrate right now? Who can I bring in everything else? It's called underwriting. And what's interesting about underwriting case, you would think that, what does it mean underwriting? The bank, let's say Goldman Sachs or somebody else, says, okay, you know, I'm going to put in my balance sheet, I'm going to buy it, and then I'm going to take it. That means they take a risk. The, in reality, it happens one minute before they sell it. it they pre, pre market it, and then they take it literally for 30 seconds on their balance sheet and immediately sell it. But what they do, they do really s strong due diligence. They have their own legal counsel, they do all the reps and warranties, they make sure that investors don't get screwed, right? So. But they also, the same cycle, they realize who they need to market to. Phase number three, when they behind closed door, the bankers select who they want to present it to, have these people sign NDA, and they go into the data room. Very manual process, very selected. The bankers can manipulate because they can choose who to show to. And plus there's also a thing called, called green shoe. When they have an excess of another 10, 15% of the offering, later to sell more by the same price of the offering to to balance the market demand to so make more money so that's so they can manipulate so in this process you basically it's 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 wall street boys pitching to to financial guys so it's really it, by the way it's very it's very um uh it's mostly men unfortunately in this exercise not that many uh, minorities part of it. So it's, it's uh, and then by the way, in music in music industry, it's white, uh, it's typical, mi in mi what I have seen, it's white, white boys pitching to Wall Street boys. That's how it's done. 
And that's why I'm going to work what we created. So um, back in 2017, I was on my road shows to one of my companies, public companies, actually, or maybe early 18. Um, and um, I came to my, to my buddy's house for a dinner on Friday, family dinner. And I'm washing my hands and I see Green Bay Packers certificate on the wall. Um, Shout out Packers fans, by yes, the way. Yes, 100%. If not for you, I w the fan buster <laughs> would not be here. Wow, that's so a lot of credit yeah. right there. Uh, th well, that's the, what the, the idea came about. Uh, and I came out from the restroom. I said, hey, Neil, what is that? He's like, well, I'm the owner of the uh, team. I'm like, I mean, what do you mean the owner of the team? I know I'm not, I wasn't born in the United States, but I didn't know that in the U.S. we have, a, we have U.S. Uh, you know, own, uh, you know, public traded football team. He's like, yeah, that's just the only one from since 1920s. And it's completely owned by, by, uh, by fans. I'm like, cool. So what do you get for that? How much money did you get? He's like, nothing. It's not for profit. I'm like, time out. What does it mean not for profit? It means you, by the way, that Neil is a C chief financial officer. He's a finance guy by trade, very smart, intelligent. And I'm like, what do you mean you find you invested in this company? <coughs> it's public and a bunch of other people invested and you guys not make any money. He's like, well, for us, the ROI, we put our jersey on, on Sunday with our family and, that our, and, they, and we say that's our team. And it, it's a triggered in my head is like, wow, this is cool. And chills. He was the original fan investor. Yes, in some respect, right? Yeah. Some respect, and 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 it's you know sometimes stars have to align for things to come out. Um, and then that Sunday when I was flying back to San Francisco, I was sitting in in, in plane, you know, five and a half hours. I got to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reading newspaper. You know, like at the beginning they give you newspapers, right? There's a, so I grab it, and it was a bit a big article about Jab Act, about changes in regulation, Jabs Act, and then how. And it, and it and it's clicked at that time, and I'm like, whoa! So now we, I'm allowed to set to present it to both accredited and non-accredited investors, and I will talk about what that the means. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, I can use public solicitation to show my <laughs> offering to everybody now. So remember the three stages I gave you? Yes. No longer third stage. I need. I can actually uh, well actually two stages. I don't need anymore because the third stage, I can I can use. Uh, social media data science to deliver to everybody, like statistics, uh, you, you send to everybody and then you do conversions. The ticket size could be as low as 10 bucks, not a million dollar ticket size, five million dollars, whatever. It's going to be as low, so it means everybody can participate, regardless of their background. Accredited right? or non-accredited. Just anybody, right? As long as, as, long as it's under compliance, properly filed, paperwork with SEC, everything else. <coughs> and then I can deliver, it. You, in some and then if you uh, might recollect, there was a David Bowie bonds. If you, some of you guys know, David Bowie bonds says that back in 1990s, when David switched his managers, he realized that he was losing about approximately 87 cents on every dollar uh, by, 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 pay, by paying by, by paying to uh, uh, to the former management or, or an, um, in the royalties. And then what he did, he used public markets, he used uh, 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 Prudential Securities here out of LA to raise $55 million to buy back his master, paying just 7.9% per year interest, and then and then eventually getting this back. L imagine, you're losing a 13 cents to 92 cents. I mean, so, th but back, that was back in 1990s. It was still, you have to invest through New York Stock Exchange, only accredited investors. Imagine if David were today to do that, uh, he can, he can through, through the app, he can access to everyone and what, and what I'm saying, everyone, not everyone knows how to invest in your stock exchange. Many people in their life only seen Wall Street through their 401ks. What about people who outside the United States who don't even know how to touch the United States? But when, when they open social media and they can see, oh, but they have this. Support, they support, support me, click, 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 and then like $500 or $300 or $100, whatever. Yes, of course, I don't want to lose money. I want to make money. But first and foremost, I want to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go grab a drink with you t and I say, hey, you know what? I'm an investor in David Bowie. What about you? Oh, no, that's too bad. So it it's emo becomes emotional investment. It becomes your, from the heart. And that's what it's trigger for us to create Finvestor. Finvestor f uh, is an equity crowdfunding platform, data-driven equity crowdfunding platform for the influencers, for creators, for celebrities, people who create things. And to, to get rid of this, the old, uh, old style economy where they have to only go through financials, financiers, people who really don't care about them, but just care about this. You know things like that. So, 
that's why we created this company. Um, we first and foremost equity crowdfunding. We got our funeral licensing, which was not easy. I, I work all my life with SEC, and last year during COVID, getting licensing was not easy. But I have an amazing team, and we did it. And it was, and I'm so proud of working next to, to uh, every single guy, you know, uh, gal. Uh, when I say guy, it means everybody. Uh, to every every team member on my team. So, uh, but then when we start working with with uh, with uh, managers, lawyers, accountants who actually manage those those celebrities. They said, this is exciting, but w maybe we can start first with um, new product introductions or specialized e-commerce. Because for them, securities is still, sounds sexy, cool, but still new, right? So It is still new. I mean, there's been the rise of the retail trader through the pandemic in 2020, and more people are now following these, these meme stocks or crypto and feeling like they're getting an introduction to the game if you will, you know, they're getting a peek at Wall Street. But what's so interesting about for investors is not only is it, a, you know, an opportunity to invest with your financial resources, but it's about investing with heart first and foremost and being able to support your 100%. favorite icons, celebrities, athletes in that way is what matters most. 100 percent. Being it, what's more, more access and inclusion to have to be included in something that you previously had no access to uh, and, and, and be part of a club. We're creating a safe zone where, where celebrities can, can come in and collaborate with their fans. Yes, the many of them are rich. They don't need money. But, but for them, it's more about collaborating, learning about celebrity. Think about the, f I'll give you a couple of ideas. Um, and, it's, it, and so for us, it's, it's actually beyond, we're, doing, we're thinking beyond uh, just raising capital. Of course, we can raise capital. We can help people to do that. It's exciting, but it's not sexy. I would be more excited to understand to open the cap table to understand who is sitting, who invested, women versus men, age category, financial status, where they live. Because I'll give you a couple of ex 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 examples here. Right now, let's say a big celebrity I don't want to name here. Let's say has a 40 million followers. He has 4.3 percent engagement. That's it. Coca Cola comes to him. He's like, well, that's all I know about my people. But if they collaborate in our platform. We have pe we can do securities, which basically somebody wants to can invest in their new restaurant chain, new tequila, uh, or uh, maybe some cannabis branding or Skin wine spirit, whatever, right? Or maybe new tour, finance their tour, whatever, something really unique, right? And that we can talk about later about the numbers and how much it's how it works. Uh, then they can do new product introduction. Let's say they come up with a new collagen, like uh, Amari Studemeyer, right? So he's a gr great guy, by the way. Excellent guy. Uh, I'm the fan. <laughs> I bought some things. Okay. Um, uh, Baruch Hashem. Um, so, um, uh, with this in mind, um, mm, we can learn about that, what in fans that invest in that. Then we can also do sweepstakes and experiences. That's what we actually did last year with DJ Khaled, Jonas Brothers, LA Dodgers, Ryan Seacrest, Paula Confold, where we create a way for people to, to win unique experiences, money can buy experiences, and also provide money to the um, um, uh, foundations like, you know, we work with uh, Meet the Kids, uh, Feed the Kids Foundation, and some t you know, so things like that. And I really want to clarify here, these are experiences, once in a lifetime, unique experiences that money cannot buy. But for the first time, fans actually had access to dream days with their favorite athletes, musicians, entrepreneurs. Well, exactly, 100%. So, so like with, with uh, uh, Jones Brothers, they they auctioned their, their guitar, sang guitar first time. It was amazing. So, it w yes, yes, yes. It was it was great. So, but um, so that's another one. And then soon we're coming out with the NFT module. So, in when it comes to a startup, startup probably can do it once, maybe twice in the lifetime, crowdfunding event. Otherwise, it's really one time event, and they're gone. In our case, we work with the infl creators who their core business is to collaborate with the fans all their life. So you can have different types of projects throughout the whole year and but we creating a database of understanding of what happened each event and it's not about who liked or didn't like the picture but actually who put money into you and based on this let's say in that example i just gave you is the coca-cola say oh i'm gonna give you 10 million dollars because you have 4.3 percent whatever 40 million blah 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 and he's like no 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 no. i just did campaigns and i actually have this is my demographics this is who they are this is what they actually putting money in and based on this this is, uh, I want you to 47, how about that? So it does Like drop. <laughs> so, th so this is we're basically giving, uh, uh, this is the first way we're providing a tool to creators 
to really evaluate, or in influencers, to create, evaluate their social media fan bases who become very mature, during, especially during pandemic, mm -hmm. right? And I'll, I can speak about market studies. How they can take that and then use it for their other collaboration. They can either create new projects. Let's say, oh, I didn't know that I have actually people who care about real estate or restaurant. Let's make, let me do create. Oh, I didn't know that Alabama, I have somebody who invested half a million bucks in me. Oh, I have so many people. Why don't we move our tour to that location? Because I have so many fans based there. I can there are so many things you can do by understanding your user base. So what we haven't figured out yet, how we can use the data generated and how we can continue we have some ideas, as I just described, but how we can actually take and create business out of this. But so for now, we're just focused on, on creating the, uh, the market, everything else, and creating a very easy of use product that even grandparents can use. And you briefly mentioned the NFT line, so that we can right. expect coming very soon. Yes, that, uh, our goal is to, uh, it's uh, actually interesting right now what's happening with NFTs. NFTs, it was a hype, and now it's, it's a kind of interesting, it's, it's, it's interesting becoming a commodity. And to us, it's kind of like a, like First and foremost, we equity crowdfunding. That's number one. All the other f items that we offered, because the managers and lawyers that uh, who manage the celebrities asked us to, to create one-stop shop so they can just come in because they value us that we understand how to work with brand, how we don't we don't screw up the brands, how we don't put them to rank next to the wrong person, how it's a safe zone for them, not like being next to the 21st century toilet producing company. Uh, joking. But um, so that's kind of where we are. NFTs, <coughs> by the way, a lot of people don't understand, but uh, it, they can be both securities and non-securities. And this is what, where we come in, because we are first and foremost security shop. We understand, for example, as soon as you have fractional ownership, more than one person, in the and that's become security. If it's a, it's a royalty payments, it's a security, everything else. So my, look, when, uh, when SEC will wake up, and it, when it, some people get in trouble, unfortunately, it, it, uh, it repeats time after time. During dot com days, if you remember, Enron and others got in yellow jackets. Some folks who didn't do a good job. During the ICO days, when they, when they realized that there was some things were selling securities, like Telegram, for example, a good case, 1.2 billion were supposed to be was refunded. Um, now with SPUCs, that happened at the beginning of the year. Already we know SEC has a bunch of companies under control because of the warrants and stuff like that. The same will happen with NFTs when, when, when eventually SEC will get to that and they will put this in place. That's why we are what we are, we, we, are, we are the ambassadors. We are this company, we are the people who understand rules and regulations, plus also in the same, uh, with a sense of humor, we, we understand how to <laughs> work with celebrities. Um, and um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, we, we can guide them. I, uh, be during the ICO days, I can, you know, uh, 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 Floyd Mayweather, he got in trouble. T uh, uh, DJ Kelly got in trouble because they were basically marketing securities to accredited uh, to non credit investors, and that's what happened. So that's we provide a level of comfort for everybody to sleep well at night. Uh, you mentioned the expertise in dealing with celebrities. That comes, of course, with some of the accolades of the people who are at the cap table, who are serving on your board and, and leading this company. Let's talk a little bit about the team specifically and sure. why you chose them. Sure. Um, um, this is a very good question. So. For um, some people tried this our model in the past. Some there were some um, uh, ways that you can you can re resonate. Um, sometimes it was a wrong timing because regulations weren't there yet, mm -hmm. and sometimes the team uh, uh, team management and the compilation was incorrect. What I mean by that, uh, we we strongly believe this is a three-legged stool. First and foremost, like I said, compliance, and this has to be at the core of this whole thing. So I come from finance, operations, capital markets, in my career I raised over $2 billion for different companies. So in plus working around the world, I understand different compliance me me messages. That's number one. Number two, um, technology. Scalable, Silicon Valley style, easy of use, technology that can scale with the right, right product, everything else. Uh, you know, Najib Bikazi, our you know, head of engineering product, solid guy with 35 years experience. So he's an amazing job. Um, he has so have, have had several exits, um, understands what it takes, and um, he's been with us since March. Uh, so third leg stool um, comes from Larry Neymar, who, who is uh, proud to our COO. He comes from uh, um, entertainment media business. He knows how the food chain works because it's like, I, like, I love what he says. You got to know how they eat, what they eat, and who is there, how they make their money. And it's, it's a lot. Uh, uh, that's the purpose, actually, why my family and I relocated here from San Francisco in November 
because he said, hey, you want to learn about this, uh, about that our business? you got to be here. You want to so learn yeah. and master LA? You have to be that's right. in LA. That's like right. it or not. That's right. That's Well, I'll, I'll <laughs> 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 exactly. I, I love No, no, I, I like LA. I mean, my family loves LA. The weather is beautiful always, always. Um, but uh, um, um, and also, uh, also another person on our team, really good, Leith Murat. I believe he already uh, was on, on your previous uh, uh, podcast. Really solid guy. He he also comes from marketing operations back, uh, background. I think it was like four years with uh, with Yahoo under Marissa as VP, and then a couple of CMO jobs. And he comes from the uh, uh, from reward system creation back in the days with with uh, uh, different companies, Nike and um, and others. So, but it's not. Plus, uh, we have on our board of directors. We have uh, an advisory board. We have an unbelievable team. Marty Pompadour. News, the only News Corp chairman outside of uh, Rupert Murdoch. He ran inter uh, uh, News Corp International. Uh, he was ABC board member. You know, Br uh, Phil Quattararo, former CEO of Virgin Records, CMI Records, Warner Bros. Brian Goldberg, Richard Report founder. That's from the, from, from the entertainment media space. Anya Golden, she's a 17-year veteran with Leighton Watkins. She took my, first, uh, my second company public in London. She was an unbelievable woman. She actually lives in LA now. Um, um, uh, and then she was a, a, in, a internal GC for big corporations, board member, everything. Uh, Rita Silas, um, she was a former CIO for New York City uh, and sits on JP Morgan Infrastructure Board. Uh, uh, that comes from compliance perspective. We, if we talk about uh, Marvin Lau, uh, he ran 500 startups. Start uh, in, in, in 500? Um, it's called 500 Startup. It's, it's a. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, 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 no. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, 500 Startups, is, so there, there are three very well incubators or accelerators, whatever you want to call it, in, in America 500 Startups, Tech Stars, and YC. Mm. Some people will say YC first, this one second, but I'm just saying, and I'm not judging, I'm just saying. So, so Marvin, unbelievable guy, he ran San Francisco office, invested in over 500, 400 companies himself. And, um, and also we have Mike Siegel, who also was with 500 Startups. He's with them. And then um, we have a few more folks on our team. So, oh, um, Young Kim, actually my former boss in my previous company, he was a uh, president of Korea Telecom, 24 billion revenue. He ran British Telecom for 28 years, well, in many different positions. So he comes from the understanding of Asian telecommunications background, but also European. So we have many folks coming from different uh, parts of the world uh, of background, but again, Let's focus. It's industry expertise, it's compliance, it's a startup world. That's basically how we positioned it. So hopefully that answers your question. Oh, it absolutely does. So tell us a little bit about what offerings are available to fans right now and what fans have to look forward to from Fanbuster. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so, so we're working on several exciting um, uh, um, uh, campaigns right now. Um, what when it comes to securities, we're not allowed to market it. We're not allowed to speak about them. Uh, it's under SEC rules. Uh, when um, we have a few charges coming, very uh, str uh, we have three charges coming up in the right after Labor Day weekend. Um, I'm extremely excited about them. Uh, one of them is um, uh, going to be from New York. Um, the folks are uh, coming with. Uh, it's called Two Richards. Uh, do, do, did you, do you know about this event? Or no? I, I know a little bit, but I've been keeping my lips sealed. So should I talk about it, or maybe I should not? Maybe well, you, I know, think that's you know, you know, you know what? What I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to uh, Larry Namer, our CEO, is coming soon, <laughs> and I'm going to. Why don't we ask him that question? <laughs> exactly. He can talk about it because uh, Larry oversees our business development. Uh, basically, he is our chief entertainment officer, and uh, so he oversees that. Uh, maybe Larry can speak about that. Um, and let's see. What, uh, well, I ask every guest on the podcast, what is the best investment they've ever made? Now, Michael, that could be of your resources. It could be financial, but it could also be of your time or of your heart. So what is that for you? Um, you know, I was, uh, let, me to, to be, uh, let me tell you this. So, yes, I've have had a really interesting career. I'm still a young guy, so that's good. Um, my investment is actually during the COVID, I invested in my life, in my family, in my family. Um, I think it's important, and, and you know what, what's interesting for in COVID, many some families actually split, and we got closer. And uh, I spent time in, in, with kids because I remember my first two kids when, uh, uh, when they were uh, little. I, I w I'm an workaholic. I put 100 hour weeks, and I did not spend any time. I mean, and I feel bad because it t you lose that time. Now they're teenagers, the, the first two, and it's different. Right? Now with the smaller, with smaller kids, I actually spend time. And what's happened with COVID? 
working from home, you get to see a lot of, the, uh, you gotta spend more time, you push to do that. And um, I'm really excited. So that was my investment. I think my biggest achievement in life, having four kids, having a happy wife, a happy family. Um, uh, uh, my parents were still with me, thank God. A uh, uh, brother with his family, so I'm really, I'm really lucky to be to be here, and this is my biggest achievement. Everything else is it's work. It comes in, comes out, whatever. Family stays with you. So it's, that's if I were to give any any advice to anybody, to any entrepreneur, spend time with your family and and don't don't fuck up. Thank you. Excuse I me for my language, but that's <laughs> important to, to do it here. No, I, I appreciate your authenticity and being so transparent. And fellow fans and investors alike are grateful to you for all of the investment of time and heart and energy you've put into creating the idea and the concept of Fanbuster and to bring it to life. Thank you for including us in the opportunity. Absolutely. I pre appreciate Jeslyn for uh, for inviting me. This means a lot to me. And um, as you know, before we spoke, I'm not a public speaker, uh, so hopefully it was it was entertaining um, soon something very I'm excited to announce in a few weeks something big is gonna happen to the company I'm super excited about that and uh, and I think we're gonna have a really fun and good ride ahead of us thank you that's right keep it here fans we'll be right back with more on the Fanvesta report fans can't stop talking about the Black Widow and ScarJo's lawsuit against Disney Let's take a closer look as the business of this entertainment saga continues to unfold. After multiple delays as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, Disney made the decision to change Marvel Studios' Black Widow to a hybrid theaters and Disney Plus premiere access release. This means that while Black Widow would release in theaters like originally planned, it would also have a streaming option at $30 per account. As a result, Black Widow might have made less at the box office than it would have otherwise. So the back end deals on profit for cast members wouldn't be as high. This caused the lead actress, Scarlett Johansson, to sue the Walt Disney Company for breach of contract. In response to the lawsuit, a Disney spokesperson said there's no merit whatsoever to this filing and defamed Johnson's character in a response to the horrific and prolonged global effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Disney claims to have complied with her contract and states that the hybrid release significantly enhanced her ability to earn additional compensation on top of the 20 million she has received to date. The outcome of the lawsuit is yet to be seen. If Johansson is able to come out on top, it could create a precedent for other actors to do the same, including Emma Stone, who is said to be considering filing a similar case against Disney after a disappointing box office sales in the hybrid release of Cruella. Other studios, including Warner Brothers, have already reported giving $200 million to pay multiple actors and actresses whose films release have been changed to a hybrid theaters and HBO Max day and date release. This continues to be a major evolution in the business of Hollywood and celebrity. Fans, if you want more insight on this and everything Hollywood, one of the genius veterans of the industry with 50 years of professional experience in entertainment, Larry Namer, the co-founder of E! and the COO of Fanvestor, will be sharing his insight on this week's episode of Everything Hollywood. Welcome back to the Fanvestor Report. The pandemic hit fast forward on the evolution of the business of the entertainment industry. In late 2020, Warner Media made the industry changing decision to change their entire 2021 film slate to a day and date hybrid release with their new streaming service, HBO Max. Fans were mostly excited to know that they could watch the most anticipated releases from their couch. Well, hashtag safer at home. But Warner made this decision without consulting any of their filmmakers or financial partners and made many public statements slamming the studio's decision as well as a lawsuit from financial partner Legendary Entertainment. A few days after the decision was announced, Dune director Dennis Villeneuve wrote an article for Variety.com, one of the leading sites in Hollywood news. In his statement, he claims that Warner Brothers has declared they are no longer on the same team as their filmmakers. In a statement from the prolific director, Christopher Nolan, he made every film in his career with Warner Brothers and said, some of our industry's biggest filmmakers and most important movie stars went to bed the night before thinking they were working for the greatest movie studio and woke up finding that they're working for the worst streaming service. Cue the awkward emojis. Earlier this summer, a quiet place 
to writer, director, and producer John Krasinski, along with his real-life wife and the star of the film, Emily Blunt, were locked in a pay dispute with Paramount Pictures. This all stems from Paramount's decision to change the theatrical window, which is how long the film stays exclusively in theaters before it can be put on streaming services, from 90 days to just 45 days. In response to the change, Krasinski and Blunt were looking for compensation. The couple both had back-end pay deals set up to profit from the film, and they weren't the only ones seeking compensation as the other producers on the film, Michael Bay included, was also seeking compensation for the change in release strategy. In the end, all parties were declined by Paramount. What has proven to be a stellar turn of events for film fans has upended the industry and all of its major players. Talk about volatility. Fans, if you want to get in on the next mega celebrity brand, well, it's time to invest with heart. Fanvestor is an innovative digital crowdfunding platform think Start Engine meets E, where fans can support their favorite celebrities, fashion icons, media moguls, athletes, actors, etc., and invest with heart. Fans can participate through e-commerce auctions with perks and one-of-a-kind experiences. Accredited and non-accredited fans can invest in equity crowdfunding projects. And right now, you can actually invest in Fanvestor. Visit Fanvestor.com for more details and exclusive perks. Fans, thanks so much for streaming this week's episode of the Fanvestor Report. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And of course, invest with heart. Special thanks to our guest, Michael Galone. We'll see you next time. I created Hair Dope is because hair colors are popping everywhere. A lot of people, your favorite rappers, your favorite singers, your favorite artists, whoever, they're dyeing their hair, they're doing things like that, and this is a world full of color. So I feel like I want to feel like everyone can express themselves through my color. <laughs> Well, to me, the importance of entrepreneurship is having a career that's longevity. You know, a lot of people jump into the game and into careers of being an entrepreneur and not having longevity in what they're doing. So that's what I really feel like. You have to put your all into it. It has to be from the heart. You have to have longevity. You have to be able to, to stay in and stay active.